the Cover 2 Podcast, episode number 11. Alongside Bengal, we are back and better than ever as, well, neither of us are all too happy at the moment, but we're back and better than ever. Actually, I, I'm really, I'm fine. I, I couldn't care less um, that the Patriots lost in the Super Bowl. It's... The way they lost was acceptable enough for me. You know, it wasn't a blowout. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a bad game. It was a good game. Um, but regardless, this was a very interesting game. We'll get to that in a minute. But let's cover the topics that we have for today. We have the recap of Super Bowl number fifty-two. We have to discuss Nick Foles' future. We're going to briefly discuss Josh McDaniels, and then we are going to fix. The team with the number three pick in the NFL draft, the Indianapolis Colts. So, without further ado, Bengal, tell me your thoughts and predictions from just just your thoughts. From yeah, like pred- predictions. Predictions moving forward. Yes, no. Uh, um, just, just your thoughts from Super Bowl Fifty Two, because I have some notes. Okay, obviously I picked against the Eagles in every round of the playoffs. Yes, as did I. And you know. They won it all. They did. I'm, I'm not going to say congratulations. I put out, like, the one tweet about it. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm done with this situation. Season's over, and there's no Super Bowl parade in my mind. I know there's one that's happened today, but I pay it no heed. Um, not an Eagles guy. This was the worst Super Bowl we've ever seen from a defensive standpoint. Uh, there was one sack the entire game. It ended up being the play of the game arguably yes um it shouldn't have happened yeah that's true it was the most total yards ever ever. in a super bowl in any game in any game any game and that would happen by like the third quarter so yeah well so so, yes uh they they broke the total record yeah um they broke the super bowl record in the third quarter they broke the total record uh in the fourth quarter which is just absurd um, if That's memory serves me correctly, there were four stops in the game, a punt, an interception, a sack fumble and a turnover on downs. Yeah. That's it. One punt from Donnie two teams. Bag of bones Jones. One punt. It, it, it was a game. So... <sighs> I have notes from the entire game. Basically, we'll start off with the first quarter. Uh, Brady threw it behind Gronk by about six inches, cost them a touchdown on the opening possession. Um, That should have been an easy touchdown. It was too far behind them. Mills broke it up, and they settled for three. I mean, that was not a good start to the game. Uh, Foles had very good placement for most of the game. He had a couple of occasions where he should have stepped up and ran with it, but decided to check it down instead, despite having pretty much plenty of room in front of him, and he did miss one of those throws. Um, Alshon was excellent to start the game, uh, to say the least. When Eric Rowe was covering, when Eric Rowe was covering him, uh, Rowe allowed two receptions on four targets for 48 yards and a touchdown with two pass deflections and Rowe got his hands in on the third one and Alshon's hands were so strong on that touchdown catch. The fact that Rowe got his hand in and tried to punch the ball loose, he actually hit the ball and it didn't jar loose at all was phenomenal. It forced them to change their game plan. Rowe versus the smaller, faster Torrey Smith and Alson Aguilar was not an ideal matchup in the grand scheme of things. Gilmore was doing well in general and he, he allowed three receptions for 17 yards on uh, seven targets, Gilmore did, in the game. So he was spectacular, um, including deflecting two touchdown passes, which was was really good. Um, Cooks getting hurt was huge. My God, he had no awareness in that Super Bowl whatsoever. I don't know how he didn't see the hit. It looked like he checked behind him, saw him, and then yeah. turned right into a giant shot. It, it, well, first off, the end around, he he didn't run that properly. He's too fast not to take the angle to the mm-hmm. edge. He, he's not strong enough to try to run through somebody, but he's fast enough that he can get around anybody in a foot race. So he went and tried to leap over <laughs> someone. That, that He got body slammed. He got beat up <laughs> in that game. He did not have a good one. And then he lost his freaking mind on on the play that got him injured. 
I mean, he was literally running in circles. But the fact that he got hurt, he was the Julian Edelman insurance. And the fact that he got hurt they showed dressed up. four receivers. The what? Four. They dressed four receivers. Yes. What happens when one goes down? And we saw one go down. Yeah. They had no backup plan. Yeah, the backup plan was use the running backs more, and it worked. I mean, let's be honest. They That offense was ab- absurdly good, despite mm-hmm. the fact they were without Cooks. But there were four key moments where they needed him most. Fourth and five, incompletion. They threw a fade to Gronk from, like, the 45-yard line. It was a terrible decision. It was a quick, he was split out wide. It was a fade to him one-on-one. The, the play design in the middle, it was just window dressing. The two Patriots ran into each other. It was bad. Cooks is there, different play. Guaranteed. Just, just because you want to have options in that situation. You trust your best playmakers. I mean, they could have tr- trusted Amendola. They could trust a lot of things. Bad play call, but if he was there, it's different. The screen at the end of the first half. They decided to run the Tyreek Hill screen with Danny Amendola. Not Philip Dorsett. They chose Danny Amendola, who got caught from behind. You put someone as fast as Brandon Cooks there, things could be a little bit different. You have to play it a little bit differently. Um, Outside of that, the play where Brady got strip sacked. You have someone who can move underneath, and that's a different play design, potentially. They were just going downfield, and it didn't work out. And then, obviously, the, uh, the final drive. If you have someone who can work underneath and just pick up yards after the catch and See, work those I, I got I to gotta chime in here because Brady on multiple occasions, on the first would-be three and out uh, before the awesome Amendola catch, Brady on the right flat had receivers open every single play and kept looking yeah. down the field. Yeah. And, and then they finally... After they got the one first down uh, on the end to Amendola, they're like, yeah. oh, maybe we go to the flat and it's successful. It's successful. It's successful. Yeah. Wrong. Multiple plays. Of, yeah. That's, you know, that's... easy yardage. It didn't take up time. Oh, Eagles and... were not yeah. playing for it at all. And Brady wasted 20 or 30 seconds looking downfield and getting rid of the ball. Yeah. It, it was bad. And they needed a touchdown with 213 left. And what were they doing? They weren't taking the play that could net them 10 yards. They were looking for the play that could net them 15 yards. Mm. And that's it, there's no point. You, you're down five points with a timeout, 2.13 left, and the two-minute warning. Take the shorter stuff. And he realized. You saw when he was about to get strip-sacked, he realized the danger he was in and to throw it to James White. And it was too late because he hitched up into the pocket twice. One hitch, good. Two hitches, right into the lane of Brandon Graham. It wasn't even that Graham got necessarily good pressure it was that he got pressure to the spot where brady mistakenly stepped into you know it's not like where in the super bowl uh super bowl 50 where malik jackson and Derek wolf would push the pocket and then Ware and miller would be right where cam newton couldn't go any further from this was a happenstance type of pressure that brady caused on himself from a condensed pocket from the back a little bit but he didn't need to do that he had men open um However, under pressure, Brady was spectacular the entire game. 10 for 15 on targeted throws, accuracy-wise. He had nine completions out of those uh, 10 accurate passes. One was a drop. For 237 yards, that is a 15.8 yard per attempt on aimed throws when under pressure. Nick Foles was uh, 7 for 12 for 93 yards when under pressure. He was taking the simple stuff. He was taking the short stuff. But my God, was he effective when he was uh, when he was kept clean? Eighty-one percent accuracy when kept clean. Brady was about sixty-eight percent. So that was a little surprising. I think Brady was taking more shots when he, he was kept clean, and he was just being really good in general. I mean, fifteen point eight yards per attempt over fifteen attempts is just ridiculous. But. Um, the Patriots also were averaging almost 15 yards per attempt off of play action. That's That was big. That's how they stayed in the game. Play action and Brady's play under pressure. But in the end, it didn't work out. And you, you might question why Malcolm Butler wasn't out there. Um, I'm not really going to go too much into that. It's said that he had a bad week of practice after coming after being down with the flu all of the week prior. 
Um, they ran a lot of nickel sets with four safeties. Or, no, three safeties, sorry. A lot of nickel sets with three safeties against that 11 personnel because the Eagles run the most out of 11 personnel. Butler would not have been on the field to replace one of those safeties, even if he was active in the game. Um, he's not a good enough tackler, while Jordan Richards might be terrible. Um, <laughs> I mean, And he is. Terrible. He's, he's awful. One of the worst second-round picks I've ever seen. Um, it just, I, I understand Butler is a guy who allowed nine touchdowns this season. He had a lot of pass breakups, but he got beat a lot and he's not exactly fast. He's not exactly big. Rowe at times showed that he was at least a good player for them this season. Butler was, he was a low level number two corner this year. That's what he was. And if he didn't have a good week of practice, I understand putting him in the best, putting the team in the best position to succeed. And if it failed, it failed. You know, sometimes I, I think I'm fine with that meta. But yeah. when you get to the second half and your defense can't match up at all, it's time for a change. Bring well, who in. Who would you have subbed? I uh, I mean, I think it was consistently was Rowe getting beat. I know he you know tried his best and was successful on some plays, but the Alshon Jeffrey Eric Rowe matchup did not work. And I know they did change that around a little bit. Yeah. Stefan Gilmore and Alshon Jeffrey was obviously more successful. And maybe Malcolm Butler doesn't match up speed-wise with either Aguilar or uh, Torrey Smith. But maybe try Malcolm Butler on Alshon Jeffrey. I know there's no, like a four-inch height discrepancy no, there. Never, 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 I, I ever, I think it would have been worth it. I have seen him get beat too many times by people who are too big for him. It. I think it would have been worth the shot when you're getting ravaged already. It's... I guess I just I think Gilmore was was excellent on him. I don't think you needed to change at that point. I think if you were going to put Butler in, it would have been as soon as you took Rowe off of Jeffrey, not you know messed with anything in the second half because it was after the uh, the touchdown that they took Rowe off of him. So that was in the first quarter. So I don't know. I I don't know what they could have done anyway. But um, it's not like Malcolm Butler's returning anyway. It's you know in in the long in the long haul. He's going to want too much money and he's just not worth the the salary that he's going to be getting. He'll get a good amount of money on the open market, but um, I, I hope the Browns don't go after him. I'll just put it that way. He doesn't fit what Greg Williams wants. You need excellent change of direction. You need a good athletic profile and while he has good change of direction, he is not fast enough to react to double moves off of off coverage like that. So he'll be an interesting player but i think that wraps pretty much up the the super bowl um any other thoughts comments concerns before we quickly discuss the next topic that's a pretty good game it was a, it yeah. was a fun game i thought it was very fun back and forth drama till the end um i i enjoyed it and as a patriots fan let me just get it out of the way this game was the least consequential to the Patriots' legacy, in general, you know they they had the nineteen, they had the uh, the eighteen and one, they had the revenge game, they had their dynasty already set well past, but it's they hadn't won in a decade, and for when they faced Seattle and they overcame that, then it was ring number five, and they came back from down twenty eight to three. I mean, this was, in a weird way, just another game. And it's possible that some of those guys got too complacent in general because it was, you know, it wasn't the same type of feel to it coming in. It's not like, oh, if they lose this game, you're, you know, what, what's going to happen to to Belichick and to Brady's legacy? Well, they have five rings already. You know, it's not like, oh, now it's competing for Joe Montana. You don't have the four yet. You don't have, you're right there with him, but you need to win another one. You know, it's... I don't know. It, it didn't feel the same. And while I'm still not happy that they lost, obviously, it, it didn't hurt the way that the Giants Super Bowls did, if that makes sense. I didn't even realize you were wearing an Eagles hat. This is actually the first hat that I got ever. This is uh, the, the first football hat that I ever got. It was back in 2002. My family friend who got me a, t a bunch of sports memorabilia stuff. I was already a Patriots fan. He taught me the game from Rhode Island. Um, I would see him in Puerto Rico every year, and he got me this leather Eagles hat. It barely fits me, 
and you know it's just it was apropos i have it on my shelf always because it's it's a good memory and it's a really nice hat but i thought i'd wear it as you know good game eagles I, it's an interesting choice it, it's more of a respect thing than a than anything because they they played a hell of a game on offense and nick Foles had a great game i mean he was safe with the football he didn't really put the ball in harm's way he wasn't always accurate but he was very good when he was kept clean and he was super bowl mvp he even caught a touchdown yeah um so as we transition to nick Foles, what is his future you figure someone's going to want to trade for him i think what they'd give up probably not more than a a second or third at the most i figure if AJ McCarron is worth a second, I which I don't know how the Browns would think that's possible. Uh, well, I don't know why the the Bengals would think that's possible either. He's not worth a sixth. No, he's, and I would I would stick by that. I, I I agree. I don't I don't think he's that good at all. Um, no, there's there's zero chance that Wentz would that uh Wentz would sit behind Nick Foles. The only way that would ever happen is if Nick Foles uh, if uh, if Wentz was injured. Still, you know, if he didn't start the season healthy then that would be the only way that Foles would get any playing time. Um, let's say location. So let's say second round pick. Locations. Uh, Buffalo, Arizona, Jacksonville. That's probably about it. Uh, yeah, that's all I can think of. Um, and I don't think any of them have the offensive scheme to get anything out of him. You know, this is a, let's be clear. Nick Foles is not a good quarterback. He is a good enough replacement quarterback when you have a great roster. I mean, that Eagles team was stacked from top to bottom on offense. They had good wide receivers across the board excellent run game great tight end play the best offensive line in football by far both in pass blocking and run blocking a great head coach who knows how to use his players this was this was the max of of nick Foles. he had very good games yeah well, in the playoffs he, he was terrible against atlanta but he was excellent against minnesota and he was excellent against new england but I think this is the max that you could ever see from him. You know, we talk about what's a player's ceiling. This was it. Playing well from clean pockets under literal perfect circumstances. Hmm. Yeah. Will he ever have that again with any place that would trade for him? Uh, Buffalo's likely, online. J- likely not. Think about the situations. Buffalo. They don't have wide receivers. They don't have an offensive line. <laughs> they barely have a run game at the moment. Mm. Shady's still good, but it's, you know, with no offensive line, it's hard. You Arizona. look at Jacksonville is probably the best possible situation for them. But even yes. then. Yeah, they still don't have the offensive line. They do have the run game. Wide receiver is yet to be determined how good that group will be, depending on what Allen Robinson and company do. And the Cardinals, they have the run game, and that's it. Wide receivers, not good. Tight end, non-existent offensive line non-existent so this is this was the peak that we're going to see from nick Foles. so wherever he goes next i wish him luck i just buyer beware and you know how nfl teams are when it comes to quarterbacks they lose their gosh darn minds but like do you see him being even a a decent quarterback in any of those places I mean, he's he's shown that he can be at least decent, and I know people are already going to be like, what do you mean? He he had great games. He won a Super Bowl. He's he's amazing. It's like, stop being daft and stupid. (laughs) Stop being daft, punk. The Eagles offensive line played the games of their lives in in those, you know, championship games in the Super Bowl. It was just the most ideal situation ever, especially in the Super Bowl. Protected so well, was not sacked the entire game. I'd love to see how many times he was hurried, because uh, I don't think he was 14, many. 14 pressures. 
yeah, that's that's essentially nothing. Especially again with no sacks. You look with a decent receiving core. You have your deep threat in. Uh, I guess potentially Alshon Jeffrey can go in that category, but I'm thinking Aguilar and I'm thinking Torrey Smith. Yeah. They have speed up the scene down the sideline, um, and Alshon you, you, Jeffrey. You at least have a number one in Alshon, which and then Alshon Jeffrey yeah. is an excellent jump ball receiver, yep. big target, and the run game decent enough power run scheme. Um, I don't know. I feel like <laughs> I feel like he played as well as you'd expect a quarterback of his caliber to possibly play. We talked about ceiling earlier. That's it. You can't expect that ever again. You can't yeah. expect that. Maybe you'll get it. I doubt it, but it's possible. Yeah, so, you know, it's it'll be interesting to see what happens with him. Um, the way that teams get rabid, there are a lot of quarterbacks on the market right now. A lot. You have, obviously... You have the quarterbacks at the top of the draft being Mayfield, you have Rosen, you have Darnold, you have Jackson, you have Rudolph. Um, did I say Allen? Uh, it's maybe. It doesn't matter. He doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, Laletta, who is going to probably be a guy who becomes something later down the road. But then you have Cousins. You have Keenum, Bridgewater, Bradford, Taylor, um, Foles, McCarron. Maybe Kaiser. There are there are quarterbacks on the market who, you know, could drive up or drive down value depending on how you look at them. Um, oh, and lastly, congratulations, Jimmy Garoppolo, on your oh, brand new deal. contract. $27.5 million dollars per year with $90 million over the first three years. It's decent. It seems decent. like it, fi- it seemed like it finally happened. For the first time since Andrew Luck, a quarterback getting paid as the number one guy who's actually deserving. Clap it up. Round of applause. But uh, that's that's it, you know. <laughs> so regardless, let's jump on to Josh McDaniels and the Indianapolis Colts. Unless you have something to add on the quarterback situation. No, no, no. I don't. I don't really really have anything there. Not much. Okay. So let's uh, let's jump on to Josh McDaniels and the Indianapolis Colts. So fair. A few things. Swindled. Swindled. Hoodwinked. That's fair. Completely what happened. They were hoodwinked. Um, <laughs> Have you seen their Twitter? Yes. They were oh, flabbergasted right. by this. Um, basically, for those of you who have been living under a rock, Josh McDaniels verbally decided that he was going to become the next head coach of the Indianapolis Colts about three weeks ago. He had worked with dear friend Chris Ballard, who is the g- general manager, um, working towards building staff and doing this, doing that. And they really never, the Patriots never actually discussed with McDaniels the terms of him staying or leaving until after the Super Bowl. So they let that time period go away. They, they chose to focus on the games at hand. They met with him, and within a few hours, he decided to stay. And he called... He did. He did call all of the assistants who were coming over to join his staff to tell them that he was going to be staying in New England. Now, those people had already signed their contracts, and McDaniels did not. But, so obviously there was no legally binding contract of any sort. Sure. Sure. So, McDaniels decided to come back. His agent, since then, has dropped him as a client... (laughs) <laughs> ironic because the agent also represents Chris Ballard he also Ooh. represents John Gruden and Jack Ooh. Del Rio spicy group his he said that if you if you don't stand by your word then you have nothing but he was negotiating a contract for John Gruden before Jack Del Rio his client was fired for the same job 
little hip- 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 hypocrisy there. Yeah. And obviously he was like, well, I didn't want to, uh, with this, he dropped McDaniels and it's like, oh, I want to support my other client in Chris Ballard. But he's a little, agents are a little slimy in general. Odds uh, Jack Del Rio gets a head coaching job in Indianapolis? Zero. <laughs> Why? I don't think he was that good of a coach. Mm. I think he needs time to fade into the background a little bit and then return to to prominence, kind of like a, a Todd Haley might one day. And um, you, you see it all the time. Even what McDaniels has done. He's, he was gone for a while. Um, been a hot candidate. Matt Patricia, by the way, congratulations on going to Detroit. Detroit. I mean, he already cut his hair the first time anyone has been congratulated congratulated on going to Detroit, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Little hey, shots fired. They may, hey, if Le'Veon's a free agent, that's a hot destination. Michigan State. Yeah, Michigan State. There you go. That's a connection. He already he took Steeler running back out of his Instagram name. Oh, did he really? Yeah, it's Le'Veon Bell now or something like that. Ooh, that is spicy. <laughs> a little bit. So, um, with all of that being said, what are your thoughts on Josh McDaniel and what happened with him? Uh, you know, not particularly surprised that Josh McDaniels decided to return to New England. I am, however, surprised that he agreed to become the Colts head coach first. I think that's probably not the best way to go about it. Uh, and yeah, he's obviously promised the job after Belichick. That's That was probably, you know, in the terms of another verbal agreement. Yeah, if that, they haven't you, can, you can't put that in the contract itself, yeah. but <laughs> because then you would violate the Rooney rule and all of that jazz. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you think what he did was wrong? Uh, yeah, yeah. I do actually. From a, from a moral perspective, it's wrong. From a legal mm. perspective, he's in the clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, still, I, it's I, wrong. I put I put a lot of blame on the Colts, but I do put a lot of blame on him. You know, you're agreeing in principle with somebody, and you have to know better. I mean, to because they put pen to paper for all of the other people that they brought in. Yeah, but, like, they weren't in the Super Bowl. I know, but I don't think the 49ers did this with Kyle Shanahan. I don't think the Falcons did it with Dan Quinn. I don't think, because they had them guarantee that they were coming on board. I don't think they signed coordinators and other pieces prior to them actually signing. It just, it seems like they got, they're too big for their own britches. And wanted to get too much done too quickly. Now, it's also possible that he got scared away by Andrew Luck. And if he's not healthy still. Which, I couldn't blame him. Now, people were saying that he'll never get another head coaching job outside of New England. I disagree. Yeah, it's probably not true. But, like, he's probably going to become the next New England head coach when Bill Belichick yep. steps down. Yes. Or they have a... Tom Coughlin, you know, like, you're not fired, but you can't be our head coach next year type deal. Yeah, yeah. But I doubt that would happen with Belichick. It's different. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, I could, I could see McDaniels doing that. But keep in mind that the Patriots have two or three people in their personnel department who could become general managers out elsewhere, plus John Robinson, plus other pieces, that it's possible that there are enough connections through throughout the league that he could find another another job per se because they have that connection he and uh cesario are great friends they went to uh college together so when if he ever leaves and becomes general manager elsewhere i would not be surprised to see mcdaniels follow suit at some point but i think that's about it the colts suck they kind of messed this up but they also got screwed by someone who they thought they could trust who is friends with the general manager you know it's this sort of thing, it, it, it shouldn't happen. It's not proper. You shouldn't agree to something in the first place if you're that easily swayed. Um, I don't particularly think McDaniels is a great coach to begin with. But now they have to resume their coaching search. And they have play, they have people in mind. Um, keep in mind, by the way, McDaniels wasn't their number one option. Oh, yeah? Yep. That was Mike Vrabel. Why? <laughs> because he's a leader. 
Yeah, don't, don't give me don't give me that. No, it matters. It does. He's matter. he's had a, a poor record, so I don't I don't want to deal with Mike Vrabel, who the, I think it was a foolish sign by the Tennessee Titans. I think he's going to be a great head coach. So we disagree on this. Remains to be seen. Yes. Um. You know, I, I think one of the most important traits for a head coach is being able to instill confidence in others. That's what Vrabel does. So th- that's my my only thoughts on that. But. Let's discuss how to fix this terrible, terrible team, the Indianapolis Colts. They have the number three overall pick in the draft, and my goodness, do they have needs at so many different places. Um, I think they're one of the worst overall rosters in the NFL. They are the worst, in my opinion. The absolute worst, and it's not close. I think they're awful. I haven't looked into it that far. Just a a blanket statement. Well, I'm looking at at their needs right now. Uh, quarterback, running positions. back, offensive quarterback. line. Quarterback, that's interesting. They, they might. Running back, offensive line, corner, linebacker, um, <laughs> maybe wide receiver. <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah, they do need wide receiver. I don't know if they have anyone competent at that position besides T.Y. Hilton. Yeah. Dante uh, Moncrief, not really. Kamar Aiken, not really. Chester, Chester Rogers, Rogers, no. Colby Listonby, DeAndre Smelter. Krishan Hogan, <laughs> Drez Anderson, KJ Brent, Justice Liggins, James Wright. Yeah, they uh they need a lot. It's it's bad. It's really bad. So let's take a look. They have a lot of cap space though. That's a good thing, right? They have 77 million cap space. Yeah, that's kind of a decent bit. Let's let's assume that they get their number one option for offensive for head coach that's left okay Okay. let's just let's just put that aside let's put on our general manager caps if you don't have one then you can be the director of player personnel or something can't be the gm um here are their free agents as i I doubt jerry reese has ever worn a hat before that wasn't some type of fedora or you know like one of those one of those just caps yeah, I don't think he's ever worn a hat before. I would, I would, uh, I would bet. Ex Giants GM for those who don't know. Yes, yes. Um, okay, Frank Gore, Adam Vinatieri, Darius Butler, Kamar Aiken, Barkevius Mingo, Scott Tolzien, Jake Muhort, Pierre Desir, Jack, Jack. God, I always do that. Jack Muhort. Brandon Williams, the tight end. Mike Person, Christine Michael, Rashawn Melvin, Don Damon. Kristen? Yeah. Huh. Hmm. He runs like a Christine. Um, oh. Rashawn Melvin, Dante Moncrief, John Bostic, Quan Bray, Eric Swoop, Jeremy Vujnovic, Edwin Jackson, Luke Rhodes, and Chris Milton are their free agents. Edwin so, Jackson has unfortunately passed away. Yes. So that is. He's not on yeah. that list. No, he's not. He he would have been an ERFA, but rest in peace to him. That was a absolutely terrible situation. Um, that's that's all we can say about that. So yeah, unfortunate. Yeah. So let let's keep moving off after that sad somber topic. First things first, they are a four three now. That is a big deal. Yeah. So Jabal Sheard will play defensive end. He's a lock. Unfortunately um, for him, I don't think he's a very good defensive end. I think he's a much better outside linebacker. I think when he was a defensive end in Cleveland, he's really, really struggled. When he was able to be an outside backer in New England and last year in Indianapolis, he had a much better year. So I don't know how much of a scheme fit he is, but that's a little terrifying after an absolutely spectacular 2017 season. Um, here's what their roster is. They're looks- very similar positions. I know they are different. Yeah, but they are similar. I think with how good he is now, he could easily transition to defensive end. I hope uh, they do the thing where they let him stand up, instead of his hand in the ground. He doesn't have the burst, in my opinion, to get that. He's, he's not that heavy. He's only two fifty five. Yeah, but I mean, I don't, I don't think he has the burst with his hand in the ground. I think from a two point stance, he's a better rusher. So, I think that's important. We're just, just worth mentioning. Um. So 77 million cap space. Quarterbacks on roster are Jacoby Brissett, Andrew Luck, Scott Tolzien, Brad Kaya, Philip Walker. I mean, 
Tolzien, uh, get rid of him as fast as you possibly can. He is that week one game was one of the worst graded games I've ever given any player at the quarterback position. It was just awful. Um, wide receivers obviously need running back. Frank Gore, as we said, is a free agent. Marlon Mack is not a bad player at all, but he is not, in my opinion, a true runner. As a as a he's not a he's not a bell cow. I think that's a position of need. Um, they don't have a fullback on roster. Tight end Jack Doyle. Off uh, center Jack Ryan Doyle Kelly. is more than solid. Yes, I like him. Center is Ryan Kelly, who will be back from injury. Very talented player. Had a down year. Um, I mean, he was injured, so it you know it's forgivable. Yeah, but, hard to sustain. Uh, Muhort was also injured, so they relied on bad players in general. Um, Joe Haig, Vujinovic. Um, Costanzo is a good player. Not a great player, but he's a good one. Then it's Denzel Good, Laraven Clark, and Tyreek Burwell as the opposite offensive tackle. So OT is t- just... That's bad. That is really bad. That's a bad. poor spot. Um, corner, Quincy Wilson. I like him a lot. Rashawn Melvin, who we'll, we would need to bring back. He had a very good season. Very good season. Uh, Pierre Desir, very talented player as well. He's a free agent, I, though. I, I wouldn't say he's a very talented player, um, but he I, could I be. He played, I thought he played well this year. Very. There's a difference between playing well, playing okay, playing, you know, and being very talented. That's fair. I, that's I, fair. I, I wouldn't put him in that category. Okay, that's fair. Um, Matthias Farley was pretty solid versus the run. Obviously, uh, Clayton Gathers didn't play a ton. Malik Hooker is... Uh, awesome. He's, he's a very talented player. Yeah, he, he is an elite talent. An elite talent is the best way to describe him. Linebacker is currently anchored by John Bostic. Poor. <laughs> that, that's really bad. That, that Poor. That's, their, that's their only linebacker. And I think, he's a, I think I said he was a free agent. Yes. Um, Jonathan Hankins, Al Woods, Margus Hunt, Henry Anderson... Interior defense, a okay, absolutely spectacular with Hunt and Anderson and and Hankins and company. I'm I'm more than okay with that group. Um, Edge obviously is Sheard, John Simon, Mingo, and that's really you know, good. John Simon's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I mean he, he was he, he was good with Houston, and I liked him there. Yeah. I don't think Barkevius Mingo is that no. talented. No, he's so. not. He, talk bust. about a bust there. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's discuss. Um, we obviously have a lot of needs. Ed, Ed Rusher is one of them. I think we need to some, to pair someone. I'm going to add that to the list. Um, I think we're good at safety. I think we're good at tight end. I think we're good at interior defense. Everything else is on the table. Yeah, so really there's pathetic. a lot here. Yeah, um, there's a lot. We'll we'll go through this quickly because we don't have a ton of time today. Mm. <clears throat> but that's, that's on me. Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's okay. Um, so with that being said, let's uh, out of the free agents, I think Jack Muhort and Rashawn Melvin are the two guys who we have to bring back. Those are must signs, in my opinion. Adam Vinatieri must sign. Let him if keep he, kicking he... and. Yeah, until if he, he wants, wants to. to. Yeah. Um, and I'd also, on a small deal, I'd like to bring back Moncrief. No, no, that's fair. I, he's not amazing, but he's yeah. decent. He, I yeah, mean, he's he, not, he, I don't he's think a, an elite a, number two, yeah, obviously, a, maybe but he's a third very or solid option. number four, and he's yeah. not a slot. So. Yeah. He's kind of like what Muhammad Sanu was in, uh, in Cincinnati. That, okay. that fourth option, that yeah. maybe somewhere in there. So. Uh, Muhort, based on everything, all things considered, I would say, uh, what what do you expect his contract to be like? He's gonna he's a very good player, so I think he's gonna get probably eight. Eight? Wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah, but he's one of the best guards in the NFL, probably. Not he's not Zach Martin. He's not he's not a Brandon Brooks. He's not even as good as Joel Batonio. But he's right underneath a. those guys. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I said a. You mentioned uh, Joel Batonio. All right. But, uh, <laughs> I, I like Joel Batonio. What can I he's, say? He's a good player. Yeah. So, eight mil a year. Um, I think that's probably fair. Yeah, he's good. Let's uh, let's go along the lines of four for 32 or five for 40. 
how old is he? Twenty six? Twenty seven? Let me see. Jack Muhort is twenty six. Yeah, probably a five year deal on that. Five year? Okay. Um five for forty. Okay. How about Rashawn Melvin? He's a uh, he's, he's twenty seven. I know he's twenty seven. He might have turned twenty eight. But otherwise, he is definitely 27. <laughs> really? I'm positive on that. Um, one. He's 28. <laughs> so he, yeah, okay. So he turned 28 probably fairly recently then. Uh huh. In the past, like, what, five months? How old is he? I don't know. He's 28. That's all I know. So it's not that important. Regardless. Well, I'm curious. October um, 2nd, within the past five months. Okay. He was a UDFA out of uh, Northern Illinois in 2013. Mm-hmm. So he's never really gotten a payday. I wouldn't uh, give him more than three, but I think he might get four. So what would you say? Uh, he's worth two. He's eight, worth, eight over two. Uh, I would, we we have the cap to burn. I wouldn't go I go over three. I think I'd give him three, because I would have him until uh, he's playing like until he's thirty, and then he'll turn thirty-one like midway through the season. Which a little dicey. I think he's worth a three-year deal, though. Okay. Again, so wouldn't wouldn't go over. How about three for if, ten? If you look at the same. Uh, all right, all right. That, we that's we a have we have enough money. Opinion. That's a little low in my opinion. But you said three mil per year. No, no, three years. Oh, I was saying four mil per year. We 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 yeah, are talking I, past each other. I think I think one. four and a half. Four and a half. Okay. Yeah. Each um, year. Three years. So 13.5 over three? If that math goes to it. Yeah, that's four and a half. I'm not a math guy. It's okay. So Melvin, <laughs> I know that's very basic math. I just wasn't about to try. It's okay. Uh, three, four, 13.5. Okay. I, I think that's pretty fair, reasonable deal. Um, so we, we cross off two of our bigger needs to return. Moncrief, what, what are we looking at with him? Uh, probably... Three and a half or four uh, for two years each year. I'm saying so, like, yeah. like seven and a half for two. Seven and a half for two. Um, it's not a very good market. I could see that though. There are a lot of other guys who I probably prefer to him on the market, so I could see that. Um, he knows the system. Obviously, things will be changing, but. Two for seven and a half. I like that. And Vinatieri will just bring him back on whatever his other his deal was three mil a year. So yeah, that's fair. One one for three. I know we'll, we'll give him two for six, and we'll guarantee like four. Just to... <laughs> two for six. Okay. And that pretty much wraps up the guys to bring back. I think for the most part. Um, yeah, those are those are the bigger names. I mean, like obviously, if you're talking about a real organization, uh, we could be like, all right, this guy, you know, one year, seven hundred and fifty k. We're not going to be dealing with that. Yeah, it's just too much nitty gritty for a stream gritty video nitty. podcast. Gritty nitty. Uh, let's see. So you're eight mil, so weird. So four and a half. I know. Let's see. That's twelve and a half. That puts us at twenty, or not twenty. Puts us at you ever listen to the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? 1550. Uh, no. So it puts us around 19 mil under. So we're about 58 mil after the resignings. So we, the quarterback situation, we can live with Jacoby Brissett, right? You know, if, if Andrew Luck's not healthy, that's good enough. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's was decent last year. Yeah. Decent. I think yeah. if we put some stuff around him, we could be better. Um, sure. Yeah. Running back market. I don't think we need to, but. I want to at least discuss this. The running back market doesn't look great at all. I don't see many bell Aside cows. from Le'Veon Bell. Yeah, which I don't no, think he would I, come I, to us. Yeah. Um, I, I guess LeGarrette Blunt would be the guy, but I don't think that's going to happen. It probably He would wouldn't. be a good pairing with uh, Marlon Mack, to be fair. What about Alfred Morris? Pair Not a him. huge Alfred Morris fan, admittedly. Yeah. I, I'd love to bring in Blunt as just... but. Well, here's my thinking. Cost-benefit analysis. What's harder to get and pay? An edge or a running back? Edge. Edge. 
edge. So, yeah, so I think with the number three pick, we should be looking towards the edge. So I think that we should probably try to add on a running back in free agency and maybe draft one as well. I mean, this is a deep running back class. Yeah, so I think very feasible to drop one. Yeah, so let's say Blunt. We'll bring him in. Um, he got 1.25 with 400 million guarantees. Let's say uh, one for 1.6. That fine? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So Blunt, one for 1.6. Okay, so that helps our running back situation a little bit. Uh, Edge, you think you know me for those wrestling fans. Um, <laughs> Product on it, on it. Yes. I, I used to dabble. You used to dabble? I see. Um, oh, yeah. Any wide receivers in free agency that jump out to you? Um, Taylor Gabriel is not a bad slot I mean, we, guy. We went over this with the Browns, and like there weren't many good options. Yeah. And... With Dante Moncrief back, with T.Y. Hilton, I would prefer to just draft maybe two in the draft. And I know there are many other needs, but if you go a wide out, a bigger wide out in the first three, and then follow one up in like the fifth or the sixth, yeah, you could, you could double dip for sure. Well, how about this? Quincy Anunua is a restricted free agent. I really like Anunua. He's coming off of an injury. Yeah, he's he probably had a not, great season before. He'll probably be a fifth-round tender or somewhere in there. Um, as an RFA, I think we should extend an offer sheet to him. The other guy is Paul Richardson, who caught my eye. Paul Richardson, to me, doesn't work because you already have guys that would do his job, and that's kind of T.Y. Hilton. That's right. And I know. So yeah. Quincy Anunua, who showed that he can be a real true number one yes. in New York— that would be very interesting to me. Tyrell Williams is also an RFA. Yeah, he's like, what, 6'3", 6'4"? I think he's 6'3". He's Who, got Anunua? size. He's a fast guy. No, no, Anunua is like 6'1". He's 6'2". Um, Tyrell is, I think he's 6'3". Six, six, three. Three. Yeah, so, but he's fast, too. Oh, he's, he's, he's listed he's a, as 6'4". Wow. Yeah. He's a dynamic player. Also, he's Cameron just, Meredith is a uh, is a free agent at 6'3". Is he really? Is Cameron Meredith a free agent? Oh, RFA. that sucks. Oh, so the Bears will probably retain, but yeah. But I think I think a Nunwa could be a guy who we could go after. I'm in on a Nunwa. Let's do okay. it. So he, what should he our... feels like he makes sense too. Sometimes like when we're doing this, it's yeah. a feeling type thing. Yeah, and he would be a perfect Z at the very yeah, worst. He, he feels like real good. Uh, so what would we offer to get him? Uh, four for twenty. Uh, yeah, that's a blazing hot deal. Would you do it? Uh, yeah, I would. I would. Okay. So let, let's say that. Four for 20 for Anunua. Um That's a lot of money for someone who is coming off of an injury, but it's yeah, still but not a lot of like, money. You, in have, the... you have the cap room, and yeah. you need the help. Yes. Just now, this helps you don't need to, maybe you can draft other needs. Still draft a wide out, for sure. But maybe you don't need to double dip now. Yeah, exactly. So we can cross wide receiver off at least a little bit for now. Uh, running back, we still want to address offensive line, corner, and linebacker. Uh, linebacker is the probably the biggest need right now because my God, it is poor. Yeah, it, it, that's an understatement. <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't expect the Colts to draft one at three. No, and they, they won't. There's a good one available. Good two, say. I think even if it is a slight reach, you need to address offensive tackle with the third pick. And I know Bradley Chubb would be awesome to compliment Jamal Sheard. Traditional 4-3 defensive end. I would throw my hat into the ring for offensive tackle with this pick. I don't think I'm there's close. I don't think there's a single player worth it. At number I three. agree, but I think you gotta protect Andrew Luck. That's the biggest issue yes, in the Colts, but right? I think I'm looking at free agents right now. Obviously, this this is a uh, not an easy decision to make. Regardless, there really isn't anyone available in free agency that's worth a damn outside of Nate Solder. But well, for, well, here's the thing: it, it's right tackle. It's right tackle that we're going after, not left. Yeah, that's fair. So, I don't think there's a single reason to go after a right tackle at number three. I understand that the position has more prominence now than it did in the past in terms of pass protection, but I can't justify it. 
with with as many needs as we have. I think if we went after someone in you know round two, I could get behind that. But I can't justify taking someone over uh, Bradley Chubb as a as a game breaker. I think it's too important. Okay, I, I can get behind that, I guess. So I'd say if we are going to pencil in offensive tackle for the second round, let's get a linebacker in free agency. Because I think that would have Who's been an even area. there? Todd Davis, Zach Brown. Todd uh, Davis. Zach Brown, I don't like. He, I feel like he would be such a cult, though. Yeah. Like, after they got to Quell Jackson, they're obviously, yeah. uh, you know, they're, like, okay to sign older you know, Frisia, I know this is if we're the GM. Avery Williamson. Uh, do we get him with the? No. The, uh, I feel like we got him with the. No, we got else. Roquan. We we didn't have the money no, with the we, Giants. We talked, we talked about him. Yeah. Yeah, I would be very much in favor of Avery Williamson here. That would work. Yeah, let's do that. He'll, he'll want a pretty decent deal. I'd say. It's tough. You, I would go as high. As six per year, I think he'll probably be in the range of four and a half to six per year. He'll get probably a three or four year deal. Maybe yeah. probably four. He's still only like twenty six. Someone said the Titans are re signing Williamson. I don't know if that's a Titans bias since he has that in his name, or if that's been reported. I don't think it's been reported yet. Um I'm gonna say it hasn't been, so we're we're assuming he's on the table. Yeah. At this time. Yes. I would say a little over six per year. So I'd say maybe that's, that's a lot. Six point five over uh, for three years. So that would put us in around uh, nineteen point five over three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. I mean, the the more I hear that out loud, the better it sounds. Like the more realistic that would, that it would sounds. put him in the Kiko Alonso below Kiko Alonso below what Thomas Davis gets around what Lawrence Timmons is getting per year. Yeah, because Thomas Davis is Pro Bowl linebacker, and I, I know Pro Bowl, yeah. whatever popularity contest. But he's, but he's a legitimately good yeah, player. Yeah, he's very good, and he and he's older. So <laughs> Sean Lee's getting seven mil per year. <laughs> he's honestly worth more. He's worth so much more. Um, yeah. Like, so well, okay, so I know, six it's a and linebacker a half. though. Yeah. So six and a half. Yeah, let's because, do that. Because we need more. We're go- going to a four three. We're going to need three linebackers. We don't yeah. have any <laughs> worth a damn. So. Uh, Three for nineteen point five. Okay, so last but not least, I think we need to go after a corner in free agency as well. Okay, we do have Quincy Wilson. We do have Rashawn Melvin back. Those are two solid ones, but that's two. We, yeah, we two need a, we need another guy. Um, right, what are the good nickel options available? Yeah, I was thinking nickel as the as the play. Um. Devon House. No. <laughs> I won't subject anyone to Devon House. Patrick I'm Robinson. really low on him. Patrick Robinson, former Colt, coming yeah. off his best career year. Yep. Uh, that was kind of redundant, but his a career year where he played excellently in the nickel, despite, yes. I think, being exposed a little bit in the Super Bowl. Not exposed, per se, but... He didn't have a great game, but yeah. he's still a very good player. Um, yeah, bring Patrick Robinson back to Indianapolis. Let's do it. Okay, what do you want to offer him after after a breakout season? He is what, like what, thirty one? Uh, let me see. Patrick Two... Robinson is thirty. Uh, the other guy is Nickel Roby Coleman. He's had a good season too. Roby Coleman is twenty six. I would be more in favor of bringing Patrick Robinson back. Okay, because I think he's better. Okay, and I would give him a two year deal. Worth. Ooh, am I gonna throw out seven per year? Seven per year? Ooh, that's that's a lot for a nickel corner. Yeah, but it is two years though, because uh, he is an older player, so I can justify that a bit more. Yeah, and uh... I think he has, he can do other than just a slot. But if you're gonna play primarily in the nickel, because we don't have the linebackers, that's definitely worth it. Okay, so two for fourteen. Yeah. Okay. I think that's good, and we're going to wrap it up pretty quickly now with some draft talk. Number yes. three, Bradley Chubb. Okay, I'm in on that. Okay. Second round, either running back um, or linebacker. Or offensive tackle, or yeah, offensive line. Yes, or offensive line. 
Um, what are you feeling here? Um, I think uh, running back is available later. I say offensive tackle. Or, I say offensive tackle yeah. as well. So uh, at number 35, we go OT. Um, the pick after that. We'll say, we'll say Brian O'Neill out of Pitt. Okay. By the way, it seems like someone would be available in this range. Brian O'Neill. Um, round three, we need a linebacker or a running back. I think we go running back here. Um, I think we need a bell cow. Real uh, bell cow running back? Yeah. You're probably thinking Rashad Penny because you're high on him for whatever reason. I was reason. thinking Penny or Chubb because I don't think Jones is going to be here. And I, I think, don't think. I don't, yeah, he won't be. I think, I think Nick Chubb w- would be a good fit. Uh, I'm not amazingly high on him, but I think he would do well for what we need. Uh, yeah. Also, Akram Wadley is one that I look at out of Iowa. Okay, so we'll I go. think I think Nick Chubb makes a lot of sense. So we get we reunite them. Yeah, cousins. Yeah. Um. So I think that's pretty good. Fourth round linebacker. Or interior offensive line. One or the other. Um. That's a fun storyline, Bradley and Nick. Yeah. I O L or L B, and probably a wide receiver in the fifth. Let me see who I would like here. I said Deion Kane out of Clemson in one of these, and so I'm like, man, Deion Kane's a second round pick. It's like, we'll see. People <laughs> drop all the time. Yeah. And like a player that you think could be a first could be a third. Player that could go like it, as high as the second could go as late as the fifth. You yes. look at uh, LSU receiver Malachi Dupree, who went like until the seventh round, and he's a player that could have gone as high as the second. Yeah. Is it just athletic profile and build? So I mean, you, you never know. I would say let's give him um, a player right in that range. I think we want height, we want potential speed. I'm saying Jaleel Scott out of New Mexico State, okay. six foot six. Wow. Decently fast, uh, explosive. I would say is a good word to categorize him um, within. It's a good yeah. characteristic. That's a guy I'm a who fan. can develop. He's in that range. It's New Mexico State, yeah. uh, so they're not exactly playing high-level competition as far as, you know, like your Alabamas, yeah. your Georgia, your Clemsons, your, you know, what have you, Oklahomas, whatever. He could um, be a really good pairing with the Nunwa on the outside if you want to move Hilton more to the slot. I'm saying. Yeah, and yeah. T.Y. Hilton works best in the slot anyway. Yeah, I mean, he can really work anywhere, but if you can put him in a position to succeed consistently in the slot with two big bodies and the Nunwa and Scott on the outside... You, you have weapons. And then I would say, let's go a more traditional edge rusher in the okay. sixth, if that's available. Or whatever compensatory picks we have. You know, yeah. We're not going to look yeah. that up so right now. We'll assume. Uh, let's go, I'm looking at that prospect list right now. Is I there another chub? That played well. Is there another chub? <laughs> <laughs> this is someone that played well uh, in the national championship. Someone that played all over the field. Deshaun Hand, Alabama. Bama defensive linemen are often fairly talented in the NFL. Yeah. If he's uh, there. Yeah, and, you know, I think he could be. All right, so I think that'll wrap things up. So let's just recap really quickly. Sure. Uh, we, we re-sign Jack Muhort, Rashawn Melvin, Dante Moncrief, and Adam Vinatieri. We bring in LeGarrett Blunt, Quincy Inunua, Avery Williamson, and Patrick Robinson. Um, we draft Bradley Chubb at number three, offensive tackle Brian O'Neill in the second round. We take Nick Chubb in the third round. Um, in the fourth, we go offensive uh, interior offensive line or linebacker. Fifth round, we go wide receiver. If he's there, Jaleel Scott. And in the sixth round, maybe Hand out of Alabama or what have you. Uh, essentially, something like that. Yeah, we have the we have the options to uh, to do these sort of things. All right, that is going to wrap this up for the Cover 2 Podcast, episode number 11. I hope you guys enjoyed. For Bangle, any closing thoughts before I sign off? I think this one went pretty well for the Colts. I think uh, I think it's obviously a much improved team. And, uh, you know, I think this was another good episode, solid. Uh, and, yeah, I'm excited for episode 12. Um, if Andrew Luck isn't playing projected record oh yeah we gotta do that i'm gonna say if andrew luck if andrew luck plays 
I think they're a nine win team. Okay. Surely because of Andrew Luck. If he doesn't, I think they win I think they win five. I think that's probably what I would say too. I'd I'd say they could slip into ten, but um I mean uh, Andrew Luck is a game changer. That's just that's yeah. a fact. He's a top yeah. five quarterback, whether people want to admit that or not. I know so I've seen some Colts fans revolt. Then he never's on the field. How can he be a good player? <laughs> that's how they all sound, by the way. Yes, that that it, it's part of Indianapolis's culture, right? It's it's the talent that's there, whether he's on the field or not. The talent doesn't necessarily go away until we see it go away. If he never yes. plays again, fair. But Andrew Luck's a guy that's going to come back and play. Yeah. And it's just, would a you rather get Andrew Luck at eighty percent with thirty percent chance of re-injury, or a hundred percent? with 5% chance of re-injury. Now, I know those are kind of made-up numbers, but you want your your quarterback to be as healthy as possible in the best position as possible. He yep. is the guy. I absolutely agree. So, without further ado, I hope you guys enjoyed. This was episode number 11 of the Cover 2 Podcast. Make sure to check it out on SoundCloud, iTunes, Twitch, live at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Thursday at Moonlight underscore Swami on Twitch. And make sure to check out the replay over on Bengals channel following the show, usually the day after or so. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right, Pace.